Our next speaker is Dr. Kevin Clark, and he will be giving a, a video presentation of the Trinity and Patristic Exegesis, how the Fathers interpreted the Scriptures in a Trinitarian key. He's Assistant Professor of Sacred, Hearts, of Sacred Scripture at St. Patrick's Seminary and University of Menlo Park, where he teaches Scripture and Patristics. He is a scholar of Biblical Theology and Patristics, or, or Patrology the study of the Church Fathers, whose research focuses primarily upon patristic readings of Scripture. His PhD, PhD dissertation, under the direction of Dr. Michael Waldstein, focused on Maximus the Confessor's biblical way of understanding Christ's humanity in a monothelite controversy. His dissertation included substantial original translation work of Maximus the Confessor's thought, on July 1st of 2022, he will take the position of Dean of the Institute of Lay Ministry and Associate Professor in the Graduate School of Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. So that's already happened. Dr. Clark is actually a very, very gifted translator. Uh, last year at the Sacred Liturgy Conference, he shared some of his translations via his uh, talks. And that, that's not an easy task to do, to work with original text or critical editions of text and come up with an English translation that is faithful to the thought and yet also understandable. Uh, it takes someone very special to be able to do that well. Uh, we've been plagued with poor translations for a while with different areas, and so our appreciation for someone who does the work to do good translations is very high. Uh, Dr. Clark will be once again speaking to us on the Trinity and Patristic Exegesis, how the Fathers interpreted the Scriptures in a Trinitarian way. Good morning. May the peace of Christ abide richly in you. Dear friends, it is such an honor to be invited back this year after having presented at the conference in Spokane last year. If the format is the same as last year, I am sure that I am most unworthy of whatever introductory remarks Father Theodore has made about me this morning. I remember well what gracious and good hospitality you all showed last year. Uh, I and my family passed through this beautiful state in June on our cross-country move. As we were having breakfast at the Sassy Biscuit, I was thinking how I would be back here in three months. However, this is only my second month in this role as Dean of the Institute for Lay Ministry at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. And last week was our, our first week of classes, so my presence is needed here this week. It is with deep regret then that I am not able to be there with you in person to share fellowship, conversation, and mirthfulness. Before I begin, I want to extend a special word of thanks to Mark uh, Salvatore there among you, for making this presentation viewable to you, and to our own distance education and online learning team, Ryan Cahill and Melissa Pordon, for their excellent work in producing and editing this presentation here at Sacred Heart Major Seminary. Check us out at shms.edu, as there are many programs we offer, including a newly launched online MA, among other options that may be of interest to you. For more information, contact admissions at shms.edu. As I begin my talk, I have a PowerPoint that will go along with it. If you would like a copy of my slides, let me know, and I will gladly share. My talk is entitled, The Holy Trinity and Patristic Exegesis, How the Fathers Interpreted the Scriptures in a Trinitarian Key. One confronts a twofold difficulty whenever approaching speech about the Holy Trinity. The efficacy of the word and the inefficacy of our words. What do I mean? On the one hand, only the divine logos, the eternal word himself, can adequately express the mystery of God. An infinity of limited words cannot convey the depths of this most central mystery of our faith. On the other hand, God himself has condescended into human language allowing himself to be circumscribed not only in human flesh, but also in human words. As John the Apostle put, uh, puts it, they touched the very life of God. 
that which was from the beginning, he says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we saw it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing this, that our joy may be complete." Quote. And so, following this example, it is not fitting to remain locked in silence before the mystery of the Holy Trinity. The challenge is to control the outflowing of speech, to say everything and nothing all at once, a temptation that confronts the author of this paper. What are the boundaries around such a discussion? Where still, we must search the scriptures to draw from the wells of divine wisdom, and then somehow yoke that to our evanescent soundings. Now, contemporary biblical scholarship wants to draw a line of distinction between the revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament and the God of Israel in the Old Testament. Many Catholic exegetes will also approach the question in this manner. But it was not so for the Church Fathers. The entire Bible is God's self-revelation, and that revelation is Trinitarian. In the New Testament, of course, this is revealed most clearly in the enfleshment of the Word. But in the Old, it was concealed beneath the fleshly letter of the law and the prophets. Christ in his coming reveals the Father and sends the Spirit of the Father and the Son upon us. But he also makes apparent what pertained to him in the law and the prophets. Hence, the Emmaus Road exposition sets the standard for the Christian approach to the scriptures for all time and thereafter. The Old Testament, too, is Trinitarian because it reveals God and God is the Trinity. In this presentation, I want to share with you a handful of patristic quotes that illustrate key principles for understanding the Trinity in the light of the Old Testament. However, because of the depths of the mystery of the Trinity, there really is no exhausting this topic. All patristic theology is a speculative contemplation of divine things. We are over-concerned in our day for the practical. What does this have to do with me? Religion is simply about being a good person. The practical is crucial, no doubt, but speculative things have primacy in theology. As you will see from these fathers, the insights they draw from the scriptures can only come from, deep specula from a deep speculative habitus. Well, let's look briefly at the uh, New Testament before we uh, get to the Old. So, uh, when studying patristic interpretation of sacred scripture, one must always remember that everything the fathers do exegetically, they do so because they believe the interpretive approach is found in or sanctioned by scripture itself. Recall that it was not the fathers, but Marcion, who wanted to draw a sharp line of distinction between the gods of the Old and New Testaments. His indictment of the God of the Old Testament strikes a familiar chord with contemporary authors, the new atheists, some non-Christians, and secular Christians, who have ceased to read the Old Testament history with the hermeneutical principles of the Church. Marcion excessively magnified what he perceived to be discontinuity in Jesus, a message that resonated throughout Asia Minor and beyond. Marcion's idea is that the God of the law is different from the Father of Christ. As with the new atheists of today, for Marcion, the Old Testament God was evil and fickle, while the New Testament God, the Father of, of Christ, was loving and merciful. This is why Marcion rejected so much of the New Testament writings. He perceived that there was too much continuity between old and new, so he wanted to stress the discontinuity. Indeed, in the Johannine writings, the apostle wishes to demonstrate that the Logos is the one 
who speaks to Moses in the burning bush. This is very easy to miss if one is unfamiliar with the Greek background. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we read the revelation of the divine name in the burning bush. When God says to Moses, Ego eimi ha'on, we might translate it in a slightly ungrammatical way to capture the different words used here. I am who is, God says to Moses. I am who exists. Because that ha'on, it's a, a participle. In fact, we might identify two different series of I am statements throughout the Gospel of John. There are those I am statements that come with predicates. So John here is, in his Gospel is picking up on what, uh, what he takes from the Greek Septuagint account of the burning bush. So there are those sets of I am statements that come with predicates. These statements are the ones we teach to our children in catechism classes from their youth. I am the Good Shepherd, I am the Light of the World, and so on. These statements, you'll notice, consistently come with a promise. For example, the one who believes in me, even though he die, yet will he live. But there are also mysterious and unpredicated I am statements, where Jesus simply says, I am, ego me. These stand alone as moments of manifestation of, divine, of the divine identity of the underlying word, logos. For example, when Jesus is speaking about his origins, he says, before Abraham was, ego eimi. And his questioners want to stone him to death. This phrase comes up again when he is walking upon the water, identifying himself as the Messiah and being arrested in the garden, among other places. If this were not clearly connected enough to the revelation of the divine name in their burning bush, in the book of Revelation, the eternity of the Danielic Son of Man is signified by the tripartite who is, who was, and who is to come. Now, typically, when we name the flow of time, we start with past, then go to present, then future. So this seems out of sequence to start with the present. Except remembering that God's relation to time is different from all others. God revealed himself in the burning bush simply as he who is. I am who is. And that's, what, that's where revelation begins when the apostle writes, who is, who was, and who is to come. Who is in Greek is haon, the existing one. He is, he simply exists. He was in the beginning with God, as we read from John's Gospel. And he is the coming one, we see here, but also as Martha beautifully uh, proclaimed in John 11 before the raising of Lazarus. The Old Testament and the Trinity. The Trinity hidden in the law. It is a popular misconception that there was no notion of God as Father before Christ revealed the Father. But that would ignore the fact that God is often described as Father in the Old Testament. Some of the ancient Near Eastern religions uh, also named a God as Father, though it must be observed that the fatherhood of the gods of the nations is unlike the fatherhood of God in the Old Testament. How is God described as Father in the Old Testament? God stands as Father over Israel. In some way, the fatherhood of God over creation is analogously associated with paternity of genealogical origin and paternity by providence. These texts do not necessarily imply the revelation of the unbegotten Father, the first person of the Holy Trinity, but because the sacred authors of the Old Testament concealed the divine mysteries, the Father's felt free to read the Trinitarian mystery spiritually veiled by the fleshly letter of the Old Testament. For example, we, we read in Exodus, God saying, And you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. 
Saint Hilary of Poitiers draws a strong contrast between the fatherhood of God over Israel and the father's eternal begetting of the son. He, he writes in this quote that you see here, Hence the people of Israel is born in such a manner that it is made. And because it is said to be born, it does not follow that it has not also been made. It is a son by adoption, not by generation. Nor is this its proper nature, but a title. For although the words, my firstborn, are written about it, my beloved son differs widely from my firstborn son. And here he's alluding to the baptism in the Jordan where the father says, this is my beloved son. But where, uh, so where there is a birth, there is my beloved son, but where there is a selection from among the nations and an adoption through the will, there is my firstborn son. In the latter case, what is his refers to the firstborn. In the former case, what is his refers to the son. In the birth, he is first the son and, there, and therefore beloved. And in the selection, he is first the firstborn son and afterwards his son. So that since Israel was adopted as a son from among the nations, it was proper for it to be the firstborn but it is evidently proper only to him who was born as God to be the Son. Now, clearly the identification of Israel as the firstborn son is an allegory for the beloved son, which Hillary recognizes. But his point is that Israel's sonship is imperfect by comparison. It does not rise to the full status of sonship that the uh, that the uh, Logos enjoys. This certainly does not diminish Israel's selection, but points to the fairer and more perfect generation of the eternal birth of the Son from the Father. He explains, Hence, there is not a true and perfect birth where it is imputed rather than begotten. For it is clear that 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 people which was born to be a son was also made. Since that which has not been is made, and because it has been made, it is said to be born, there is, as a consequence, no true birth. For previously it had been something else before it had been born. Therefore it was not before it was born, that is to say, before it was made. Because he who is a son from among the nations is a nation before being a son. And consequently, he is not truly a son because he was not always a son. But there, never, there was never a time when the only begotten God was not the son, nor was he anything before the son, nor was he anything himself except the son. Thus he who always is the Son, has not allowed us to think of himself as one who at one time had not been. And you can hear the Arian um, uh, d debate in the background here of the Son. The, the Arian assertion, of course, is that the Son was made, uh, uh, not eternally begotten. Right. So, so that it clearly is in the, the background here. Let's speak now about the uh, divine pronouns. The dogma of the Trinity, as you have no doubt heard from numerous presenters already, does not jeopardize the unity of the one God, lest we fall into what's called tritheism, or thinking that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each individual gods. But it must be observed that contemporary readers bring this common uh, presupposition into their reading of the Old Testament, namely that the sacred author could not have asserted a Trinitarian God before the revelation of Christ. And this is a very unpatristic presupposition. For the fathers, God is the Trinity. Therefore, contemporary readers will explain away the plural pronoun in the Genesis creation of mankind. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
Later, when Adam and Eve fall, God says, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live uh, forever. On the presupposition that the sacred author could not have known a Trinitarian God, contemporary interpreters will argue that this is akin to the royal we, or that God is addressing the angelic hosts. But Augustine goes to this passage directly when he interprets how Christ could say, I and the Father are one. Famously in De Trinitate, Augustine looks for an image of the Trinity in creation. The Son himself, of course, is the perfect image of the Father, but we do not say that we human beings are the image of the Father, but rather that we are made in the image of God, in Imago Dei. And so, human creatures are made in the image and likeness of God, who is a trinity. Augustine explains, Let us make and are, are said in the plural, and ought not to be received except as of relatives. For it was not that gods might make to the image and likeness of gods, but that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit might make to the image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in order that man might subsist as the image of God. But God is the Trinity, end quote. For Augustine, this point cannot be stressed enough. The plural pronouns applied to God reveal that man is a creature made in the image of the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why he will later in the work go on to talk about the image of the Trinity in the human creature. Quote, the mind itself, its knowledge, which is its offspring, and love as a, as a third. These three are one and one substance. And he also uses the example of um, the, the, uh, in the soul as lover, beloved, and, and lo the love. So he finds these images of the Trinity in the person. However, uh, long before Augustine, Justin Martyr had this to say about the divine us in Genesis 3.22. Quote, Now the words, as one of us, clearly show that there were a number of persons together, and they were at least two. I do not consider that teaching true, which is asserted by which you uh, call a heretical sect of your religion, nor can the prophets of that heresy prove that he spoke these words to angels, or that the human body was the result of the angel's work. But this offspring, who was truly begotten of the Father, was with the Father, and the Father talked with him before all creation, as the scriptures through Solomon clearly showed us, saying that this son, who is called wisdom by Solomon, was begotten both as a beginning before all his works, and as his offspring, end quote. Now, biblical scholars would call this kind of reading eisegesis, or reading into the text. But such protestations reveal a position that God could not reveal himself as Trinity to a sacred author, which, in my view, is contrary to the divine power to reveal as he wishes. He is God, after all. A careful reader will notice that uh, further in Genesis, Seth, the son of Adam, is described in the following way. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. Now, many of you who have read Genesis have probably already made the observation that this text clearly implies that God is not only the creator of the first parents, but even their father. Consider Luke's genealogy, tracing Jesus' line 77 generations from Joseph to God himself. It culminates the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. The fathers pick up on this connection in Genesis between image and likeness from creation to human genealogy. Ephraim the Syrian, for example, simply and clearly states, quote, 
in Seth, uh, in Seth, who was like Adam in all things, was depicted the likeness of the Son, who was sealed by the Father, his progenitor, just as was Seth by Adam, his begetter. End quote. Ephraim, throughout his works, often makes connections between Seth and Christ, just as Seth restores dignity to the line of Adam, which was lost by Abel's murder at the hand of, hands of Cain. So also Christ restores dignity to the human race, which was lost by Adam's transgression. The above interpret interpretation by Ephraim makes a subtle but quite direct connection to what is mystically revealed about the father's sealing the son. Uh, quote, on him has God the father set his seal, end quote from John 6, 27. The layers of Trinitarian meaning appear when one remembers that the seal is an image for the Holy Spirit. Let's now look at Proverbs 8, Christ as eternally born and created. For the theological descendants of the Heresiarch Arius, Proverbs 8.22 refers to the Son and indicates that though the Son is not a mere creature in the way you and I are creatures, he still is created. And so this became an important proof text for, uh, for Arius. There was when he was not, as Arius uh, liked to say. But as Charles Kanengeser points out, quote, the paradox of such a use of scripture became for Arius a fatal trap and a dead end as he persisted in taking scripture verses as literal proof texts or as metaphors allegedly supporting his own notion of deity, end quote. While Trinitarian readings of scripture predated Arius's innovation, his approach all the more intensified the father's exegetical correction and then employment of this particular passage. Even after the Council of Nicaea, Arian thought continued to influence the discourse, especially through Eunomius. I should add that the interconciliar period between Nicaea in 325 and Constantinople I in 380 to 381 proved to be an especially fruitful time in the patristic era. Gregory Nazianzen, who presided over the Council of Constantinople, which helped give the Nicene Creed its final form that we are so familiar with today, carefully exegetes this passage from Proverbs 8.22, which reads, The Lord created me at the beginning of his ways for his works. End quote. This is a particularly difficult text. The Greek word here for create is altogether unfitting when applied to the divine nature or even to the Son or the Holy Spirit, whose processions could never be described as created. Gregory reveals that this text is readily available at the hands of Eunomian apologists who emphasize the essential dissimilarity between the Father and the Son. This passage is obviously what one would call an aporia or a difficulty. As you can imagine, if the Son is wisdom and wisdom is created, then the Son would seem to be created. But in the power of his rhetorical genius, Gregory presents two initial options. The first is to cancel the works of Solomon altogether. However, he moves on to a more plausible option, the option, the option of metaphorical language. If heavens speak and, heal, and hills leap, then why not take wisdom's creation metaphorically? Notice the implication of what he is developing rhetorically. The force of the absurd of suggestion that we abolish Solomon shows us just how significant is the primacy of the Trinitarian dogma. So before we arrive at Gregory's solution, we must marvel at this rhetorical prowess before we contemplate his exegetical mastery. His, his answer involves something known as partitive exegesis, and he bases his solution on something he discovers a few verses later in the same chapter of Proverbs. He writes, we adopt 
neither of these approaches. We don't cancel Solomon, right? And we don't interpret this metaphorically either. Though they have, we, we, we adopt neither of these approaches, though they have been taken as forceful by some of our predecessors. No, let the statement stand as that of the Savior himself, the true wisdom. Let us look at it together for a moment. What reality has no cause? Godhead. No one can talk of the cause of God, otherwise it would be prior to God. But what is the cause of manhood, which God submitted to for us? Our salvation, of course. What else could it be? The passage is now free of complication, seeing that we find here clear, find there clearly both expressions created and begets me. In Proverbs 8.25 Whatever we come across with a causal implication, we will attribute to the humanity. What is absolute and free of cause, we will reckon to the Godhead. Created has a causal implication, has it not? The text, in fact, runs, He created me at the beginning of His ways for His works. The works of His hands are truth and judgment. And for the sake of these works, He was anointed with deity. Deity being the humanity's anointing, but the expression begets me has no causal implication. Indicate, if you can, some qual qualifying term for it. What objection will there be then to the wisdom's being called creature in respect to earthly generation, but offspring with regard to the primal and less comprehensive one? So what's beautiful here is that Gregory reads the two births, both the eternal birth of the Son from the Father, from, from all eternity there in wisdom, or in Proverbs 8.25, but then he reads the human birth, as it were, in the created, uh, 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 the, word of the, the use of the word created there in Proverbs 8.22. So no need to cancel Solomon, that's good news, uh, or any of his works. Where did John the Evangelist get the notion that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could be described as the Logos? Not only does this descriptor come up in John, but also in Hebrews. The sacred authors apply it with precision to the second person of the Holy Trinity. He is the uh, Logos tu theu, the Word of God. Uh, and there was a really good article in the Catholic Biblical Quarterly uh, a number of decades ago that uh, that, that takes up this question of where, where did uh, John get this notion of the Logos? And it's very clearly there in the language of the Old Testament. So the second person of the Holy Trinity is described as Logos because he is described as uh, Logos in, in a veiled way in the Old Testament. So for example here, in this uh, text from Justin Martyr in the second century, which is, um, as you can see, well before the Council of Nicaea takes up the question, he wrestles with this. And he says in his dialogue with Trypho, So, my friends, I said, I shall now show from the scriptures that God has begotten of himself a certain rational power as a beginning before all other creatures. Now, of course, rational uh, comes from the Greek word uh, logike, which is related etymologically to the word logos. The Holy Spirit indicates this power by various titles, sometimes the glory of the Lord, at other times Son, or Wisdom, or Angel, or God, or Lord, or Word, and so on. And then later he says, uh, uh, we can observe a similar example in nature when one fire kindles another without losing anything, but remain remaining the same, yet the enkindled fire seems to exist of itself and to shine without lessening the brilliancy of the first fire. My statements will now be confirmed by none other than the word of wisdom, who was uh, who, who is this God begotten from the universal, fa universal Father, and who is the word and wisdom and power and glory of him who begot him. And now let us proceed, pun intended, to uh, have a look at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. 
in the eyes of the fathers. So the, the spirit, obviously as spirit, right? Father Thomas Joseph White, in his recently published book on the Trinity, identifies three reasons that the Holy Spirit is God uh, for the Cappadocians, right? Firstly, because he divinizes us. And he could not truly divinize were he not divine, as divinization is a divine work. Cannot give what you do not have. Uh, I cannot divinize you. Only God can uh, divinize you. Our parents can't divinize us. No one. Not even the angels. Um, so, secondly, uh, because he is identified, the Holy Spirit is identified in the gospel as proceeding from the Father. Procession, though, puts him in relation, which must be eternal. And then thirdly, in practice, he is worshipped as God. Gregory, the theologian, begins his so-called fifth theological oration, Oration 31 on the Holy Spirit, by taking up this contention that the Holy Spirit is unscriptural. Before the Council of Constantinople in 380, there, there arose a contention over the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Similar controversies over the consubstantiality of the Father and the Son were projected onto the question of the Holy Spirit. One group that denied his divinity were called the Pneuma Tomakoi, Greek for the Spirit Fighters, which would probably make a great punk rock band name. Um, but in, in Gregory's words, if uh, to go back to the question, if one existed from the beginning, so did all three. If you cast one down, I make bold to tell you not to exalt the other two. Gregory makes clear throughout his oration that the biblical teaching of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is well established. After a thoroughgoing theological reflection of those who are fighting desperately against the Spirit, he finally, in this, in this oration, provides a smattering of proof texts that show the eminently biblical nature of his doctrine of the Spirit. Uh, time does not avail for us to read this entire text together, but you can see how in such a really a brief quote, he brings together what I think are about five dozen biblical allusions. And just to, to look briefly at how he uses the Old Testament here, uh, in the middle of the quote, he says, uh, he is called Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, Mind of Christ, Spirit of the Lord, and Lord, absolutely. Spirit, spirit of adoption, of truth, of freedom. And then he moves to Isaiah. Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, true religion, and of fear of the Lord. This spirit indeed effects all these things, filling the universe with his being, sustaining the universe. His being fills the world. His power is beyond the world's capacity to contain it. It is his nature, not his given function, to be good, to be righteous, to be in command, and so on. So, here he's, he's moving between, uh, b between Isaiah, the Psalms, uh, the, the, the Book of Wisdom, all sorts of different uh, places in the Old Testament to draw forth his doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And, and this, this quote really is uh, an excellent example, generally, of how the fathers use Scripture and how imbued they are with sacred Scripture. Look at how succinctly he speaks with bringing together dozens and dozens of biblical allusions in such a short time. So, uh, toward the end here, he appeals to a, a couple of passages from the Book of Wisdom. And he says, He is intelligent, manifold, clear, distinct, irresistible, unpolluted. Or in other words, he is utterly wise. His operations are multifarious. 
He clarifies all things distinctly. His authority is absolute, and he is free from mutability. He is all-powerful, overseeing all and penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent and pure and most subtle. Meaning, I think, angelic powers as well as prophets and apostles. He penetrates them simultaneously, though they are distributed in various places, which shows that he is not tied down by spatial limitations. So let's move from Gregory's uh, broad sweeping look at a panoply of scriptural references to zero in on a more precise reading of Wisdom 917 from Didymus. Wisdom 917 reads, And who has known your counsel except that you gave wisdom and sent your Holy Spirit from the highest? Didymus says, Further, in the Book of Wisdom, which is named Pan Aritas, or All Perfect, by those who have obtained from God the gifts of grace. The voice there is understood to be giving thanks to God, who has searched out what is in the heavens. Or, I'm sorry, who has searched out what is in the heavens? Who has come to know your will unless you have given wisdom and sent your Holy Spirit from on high? And thus the paths of those on earth were made straight and people were taught what is pleasing to you. In this text, the Father not only gives the wisdom of God, that is, His only begotten Son, but also sends the Holy Spirit. So Didymus finds there both processions hidden in this succinct verse from Wisdom. In Wisdom 7, 22-23, uh, this becomes a text that, that Ambrose will employ to illustrate the uh, doctrine of the Holy Spirit. In Wisdom 7.22 and following, we read, For in her, or wisdom, is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, only begotten, manifold, fine, agile, articulate, unblemished, distinct, harmless, good-loving, sharp, unhindered, beneficent, man-loving, steadfast, secure, carefree, almighty, all-seeing, and penetrating through all intelligent, pure, and most agile spirits. So here we've got wisdom, we've got the spirit of wisdom that is in her, and we've got what are clearly divine attributes within this spirit that is in wisdom. So Ambrose then says, But what shall I say? Because as the Father and the Son too, so the Spirit is without stain and omnipotent. For Solomon called him in Greek, pantodunamon, panepiskopon, because he is all-powerful and the surveyor of all things, as was shown above, to be read in the Book of Wisdom. Thus the Spirit also is in honor and in majesty. Let's look at the Trishagion and see how the, this reading of the Trinity then enters into the liturgy. Finally, it is worth noting the presence of the doxology throughout the liturgy, prominent in both Eastern and in Western liturgies. This has its most climactic expression in the Trishagion, literally thrice holy. That's what Trishagion means, thrice holy. Taken from Isaiah 6 and then echoed in the book of Revelation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Cyril of Alexandria finds a succinct expression of the doctrine of, of the Trinity, and really of the doctrine of God in this powerful verse. He writes that the the seraphim, quote, say holy three times and then conclude with the Lord of hosts. This demonstrates that the Holy Trinity exists in one divine essence. All hold and confess that the Father exists along with the Son and the Spirit. 
Nothing divides those who are named nor separates them into different natures. Just the opposite is true. We recognize one Godhead in three persons." End quote. Just as the sign of the cross is the perfect expression of the two central mysteries of our faith, so also is the Trishagion for Cyril a synthesis of the doctrine of God. Three holies refer to the three persons. The Lord of hosts refers to the oneness of the Godhead. Liturgically, the Trishagion then also is embellished, especially in the Eastern Rites, that we occasionally hear this in the Latin liturgy, as in the Good Friday Improperia. Hagias Hatheos, Holy God. Hagias Iskiros, Holy Mighty One. Hagias Athanitas, Holy Immortal One. Elei Sanhimas, have, have mercy on us. It is in this context that St. Maximus the Confessor speaks in his mystagogy, and, and if you're not familiar with that work, his mystagogy, he goes through the various different parts of the liturgy and explains their deeper theological significance. So we, we look at his uh, quote about the, uh, the Trice Hagion. He writes, quote, The threefold proclamation of holiness exclaimed by all the faithful people in the divine hymn intimates the oneness and equality of honor that shall be revealed to the incorporeal and intellectual powers in the future. The hum then human nature will be taught to sing in harmony with the powers above and to, describe, to ascribe holiness to the one deity in three hypostases. And this singing will be in harmony because of the identity of the three consecrations with the unchangeable, ceaseless motion around God. So for Maximus, the Trishagion represents a kind of a, a, a training for future heavenly worship. And, uh, and, and so it's, this is one of the reasons why, especially in the East, the, um, the, the Trishagion is repeated uh, multiple times throughout the liturgy. And uh, it's, it's very beautiful how uh, it continually trains the, um, the, uh, the worshipers to uh, acclaim the, the thrice holiness of the Trinity throughout the liturgy in, in a very palpable way. In conclusion, there are, I think, four key ta takeaways from this brief presentation of patristic texts on the Trinity. First of all, the revelation of the Trinity in the Old Testament is necessarily in a veiled manner. The time for the clearest expression of Trinitarian doctrine is in the coming of Christ and the sending of the Spirit upon the Church. So it is the grace of the Holy Spirit that then enables us to look with graced Trinitarian eyes into the text of the Old Testament. Secondly, contemporary readers of the Bible argue that Trinitarian readings of the Old Testament project Christian doctrine contrary to the author's intent. However, it is clear enough that the fathers take seriously the unity of the divine nature, even when they find the Trinity in the Old Testament. And if you look at the, uh, what, what the Gospels say about Moses, about Isaiah, it's clear that Jesus ascribes a kind of a mystical sight of the sacred authors into the divine mysteries where they are they have a special gift in the act of inspiration where they are uh, empowered to write about mysteries that will be revealed later with greater clarity but they're empowered to write about the mysteries in a hidden way so it's truly not eisegesis to read the scriptures this way or to read into the scriptures. Uh, this is true exegesis. It's spiritual exegesis or reading spiritual mysteries out of the texts. Thirdly, the approved fathers have no reservations about reading the Old Testament in a Trinitarian way. It has always been a tendency of their opponents, uh, rather, to drive a wedge between Christ's revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament 
and the established doctrine of God in the Old Testament. It is my position that our readings should imitate theirs. He is a, a no-good son who looks at his father's methods as though they were inferior to his own. What good son is there who does not rush to imitate his father? So we should practice this mimesis or imitation in our readings of the fathers. There's, there's nothing to fear. Read the scriptures in the spirit, in the same spirit in which that they were inspired. Go to prayer. Uh, take uh, the scriptures with you into prayer. Read the, the interpretations of the fathers and learn from them. And, and you will see the, the depths that the Spirit has, uh, has led the fathers to you know, throughout the history of biblical interpretation. Finally, rather than undermine, undermining Trinitarian doctrine, the Old Testament provides a sure support for the fathers in its development. Yes, this is the shared testament between Christians and Jews, and therefore we are indeed reading the same words about God, even though this must be said with some qualification due to variations in canon and textual traditions. However, just as we do not shrink back from finding the mystery of, of Christ's incarnation, last year's theme, hidden in the Old Testament, so also we should not shrink back from from understanding the central mystery of our faith revealed in a hidden way in the Old Testament. We see that the fathers did not. Thank you. And briefly, uh, I have a slide with my contact information. Again, I really wish I could have been there in person with you, um, but uh, feel free to send me an email if you have questions or follow-up thoughts. You can contact me at the address below. You can also follow me on social media and uh, or you can pass your questions or comments along to uh, along to Father Theodore to Lynn and they will be able to reach out to me and, and put us in in contact. Thank you again for uh, your your flexibility and allowing me to, to meet with you uh, virtually through this means and I hope that we can share one another's company again. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Clark. Of course, we know the real reason why he wasn't here is because he wears a bow tie. Um, but uh, we are not bow tie fighters. Um, but uh, definitely missed his presence and his uh, company and uh, engagement and conversation. But uh, we're grateful for the effort he made to put, make that video for us. Uh, the Fathers of the Church and the Trinitarian Faith, uh, Dr. Clark, was able to work through quite a few different scripture passages, but also quite a few fathers, looking at Augustine, Ephraim, Gregory, and also Gregory the Theologian, Justin Martyr, uh, Didymus, Ambrose, and then one of his favorites, of course, uh, Maximus the Confessor, and Cyril of a Alexandria. Uh, there he pulled from different continents and different centuries to show a, a pretty convincing case that the fathers of the church had no problem seeing the Trinity uh, revealed, it, perhaps under a veil, but revealed in the Old Testament. Uh, God described as Father in the Old Testament. God certainly described as the Spirit in the Old Testament, and they were able to see the Logos in the very text of the Old Testament. So we have the Father, Son, and Spirit. The language, therefore, of Christian Trinitarian understanding of God is very much a part of the Old Testament text. And the fact that the Father saw that was not a reading into the text, but simply being able to see what is there by the divine author, and not only the divine author, but the human author, for example, Moses, that Moses was, according to Jesus, who is a pretty good source for Christian thought, Moses saw the time of Christ. And so the fathers would argue that they are not doing a, an eisegesis, but an exegesis. The, uh, the seal is another image that the fathers saw as the sign of the Holy Spirit. And 
for example, Gregory was able to see the two births of Christ, the eternal and the human. Now, this is very interesting for Thomistic scholars. Uh, did Thomas learn this from Gregory? Perhaps uh, Gregory's ability to see that pertaining to the humanity in reference to his human birth, that pertaining to the divinity in reference to his timeless begetting or, or eternal birth. Now, we already mentioned the Logos, Isaiah, Psalms, wisdom literature, of course, Genesis, but especially wisdom literature being places where the uh, fathers of the church are able to see the activity of the Trinity in Old Testament texts. Uh, wonderful there with uh, Cyril of Alexandria and this uh, commentary on the thrice holy, holy, holy as a, a sign of the Trinity in divine revelation. But isn't that interesting? The sign of the cross is that one of the perfect expressions with the, with the uh, thrice holy, uh, thrice um, hagion, holy, 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 uh, the sign of the cross being the Father, Son, and Spirit, the revelation of the Trinity, but then calling to mind the salvation and the crucifixion and then implied the resurrection of the Lord. Uh, Father gave a great, re or Father, Doctor gave a great review there of his talk with the four points, so no need to um, go through those again. But once again, we appreciate the effort that Dr. Clark made in putting that video together and all involved.